in the spirit of being hilarious, I'm going to show you some really hilarious quick memes from quickmeme.com, for which I actually don't deserve any credit. I just think they're funny. There are more pictures making fun of college freshmen. Freshman of the day, this guy says, actually tries to do all assigned reading. Dies. And this one says, goes to Uganda to help the cause. Dies. Microwave dies. Dies. Does laundry for the first time. Dies. <laughs> oh, dang. I love these not only because they're funny, but also because the freshman shown looks kind of like my younger brother-in-law. After today's lecture, which will cover sections 6 and 7 of chapter 14, you should be able to do the following. It's a very long list. Buckle up and get ready. First, determine a chemical process's overall reaction from its elementary steps. Second, identify intermediates from a reaction's elementary steps. Third, determine if a reaction is unimolecular or bimolecular from the elementary steps in its reaction mechanism. Fourth, identify the rate determining step from a reaction's elementary steps. Fifth, Predict rate laws for simple unimolecular reactions. Sixth, explain the difference between a homogeneous catalyst and a heterogeneous catalyst. Seventh, explain why bromide is a catalyst in the following reaction. Eighth, explain why catalysts speed up reactions. And ninth, explain what enzymes are, how they work, and how the lock and key model accounts for their specificities. We will cover all these in this and two subsequent videos. It's a long list, so let's get started. As you know, a balanced chemical equation tells us about the substances present at the start of a reaction, which are called reactants, and the substances present at the end of a reaction, which are called products. But it doesn't tell us anything about how the reactants are converted into the products at a molecular level. The path that reactants traverse to become products is called a reaction's mechanism. For example, we talked about this reaction in an earlier lecture, to which I'll link right here. Using collision model reasoning, we could imagine this reaction being driven forward by a bunch of molecules, A, colliding into each other, bam, 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 with enough energy to cause them to rearrange and pass through transition state C, and then convert on to product B. We could also imagine similar things about this reaction, where NO and O3 convert to NO2 and O2. In other words, NO and O3 hitting each other, or colliding into each other with enough energy, bam, 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 to be able to traverse whatever transition state is necessary to convert into these products, NO2 and O2. Reactions like these, which occur in a single step, are called elementary reactions. Reactions that have only one reactant in them are called unimolecular. Ones that have two reactants in them are called bimolecular. And ones that have three reactants in them are called termolecular. I have no idea why they didn't call them trimolecular, because that seems like it'd be simpler. But whatever. Termolecular reactions are so rare that we really won't talk about them very much. So here's a reaction we're going to focus on for just a minute. NO2 combining with carbon monoxide to form NO and carbon dioxide. Doesn't look too hairy, right? Well, as it turns out, this reaction doesn't occur in a single chemical step. The full transformation actually transpires over the following two steps. In the first one, two molecules of NO2 get together and combine collisionally, bam, 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 to form one molecule of NO3 and one molecule of NO. At this point, the NO3 then reacts with a molecule of carbon monoxide, bam, 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 to form NO2 and CO2. So in other words, this transformation doesn't happen as simply as the overall reaction would lead us to believe. We therefore say that this process occurs by a two-step mechanism. Each of these steps is called one elementary step in the reaction's overall reaction mechanism. You'll notice that if we add the two elementary steps that I just showed you together, and we keep everything that's on their reactant sides on the reactant side of an overall reaction, and everything that's on the product sides of both of those reactions together on a grand product side, we end up getting this overall reaction shown right here. Now you're welcome to pause the video right here and make sure that that all makes sense to you. Now at this point, you should notice that we can algebraically cancel out NO3 from both sides of the equation. The reason is because we have an NO3 right here on the right side and an NO3 on the left side. So we can just cancel them out like this. We can then subtract the NO2 on the right side of the equation. You see that one right here? We can subtract it from both sides. So we take away an NO2 on the right side and take away an NO2 from these two NO2s on the left side. And when we're done with all of that, 
we end up with a net or overall equation that looks like this. You should notice this is the overall reaction that we started with. NO2 plus CO yielding NO and CO2. Okay, I realize this looks a little bit complicated, but in the end, it's actually not too bad. We can see that if we add up each of the individual elementary steps in an overall mechanism and then cancel everything out, we will end up getting the overall reaction for the whole process. That is the one that we started with. Hopefully that makes sense. Now I've got a couple of tips I have to tell you. In this previous reaction, you'll notice that NO3 was canceled out. That is called an intermediate because it doesn't appear in the final reaction, but does appear in some of the elementary steps. This means that NO3 is only formed transiently along the way as reactants convert to products. I'll show you that by using this cool energy diagram where we see the reactants, NO2 and CO, here at the left, the products, NO and CO3, here at the right, and this intermediate, NO3, being this valley right in the middle. Remember that transition states are very short-lived, high-energy or low-stability structures that exist momentarily between reactants and intermediates. The energy hills, these peaks here on top of the hills, that are in between the valleys are where the transition states lie. Now the height of those hills are called the activation energies, or E sub A, for which there is one right here and one right here. This takes us to a glorious set of lecture questions. Let's imagine that each of these lines represents one elementary step in a three-step reaction mechanism. Now I'll ask you these questions. Question one, is the first step shown here unimolecular, bimolecular, or termolecular? Question two, what is the overall reaction? And question three, how many intermediates does this reaction have overall? Now I'm not going to do this problem for you, but we'll let you refer back to what I talked about earlier in this video and then attempt to do it on your own. Now I'm going to talk to you more about reaction mechanisms and rates. As we discussed during our last two lectures, to which I'll link here, the rate law for a unimolecular or first order reaction is this. The rate law for a bimolecular or second order reaction can be this or it could be this, depending on the specific reaction. Now, believe it or not, other combinations of rate laws exist for uni, bi, and termolecular reactions. This table shows a few examples of those, and you can see they can get pretty complex. You're welcome to pause the video here and look at these more closely. To students who take this class from me, I want to reemphasize that I will not have you derive any of these more advanced rate laws, but will instead only focus on unimolecular and simple bimolecular rate laws on our exams. As we've learned thus far, most reactions occur through mechanisms that involve two or more elementary steps. Each of these steps in a reaction's overall mechanism has its own rate constant and its own activation energy. Oftentimes, one of those steps is much slower than the others. The slowest step in a multi-step process is called the process's rate determining step. To understand the concept of rate determining steps, you're welcome to read these pages from our text or listen as I tell you the story of me working on an assembly line. A number of years ago, as I uh, began college after a short break, I worked on an assembly line helping to manufacture treadmills. It was great. I got paid well and I got the opportunity to put a screw in a hole and pass it down the line for nine hours a day. Oh yeah. Now if you can imagine how an assembly line actually works, I want to ask you this. If there is one person on the assembly line that works slower than all of the other people in the assembly line, what is the speed with which the final product comes out the end of the assembly line? Yeah, if you guess that that speed is equal to the speed of the slowest person, you are correct. And I hope that makes sense. It stands to reason that if I'm a person working on an assembly line and I'm really slow, I'm slower than everyone up the line from me and everyone down the line from me, then the speed with which that product comes off the end is equal to the speed of me, the slowest person. I'm sitting there putting a screw in the hole, do, 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 and I'm slower than everyone downfield and upfield from me. As soon as I finish my uh, putting my uh, screw in the hole, I pass it to the next person who goes bam, does that person's job, and then goes the next person, bam, the next person, bam, the next person, bam, and then all of those people, because they're so much faster than I am, are just waiting for me, do, 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 before they can do their job, and they're done before I'm done with my next 
screw putting in a hole. Similarly, the same thing happens for everyone up the line from me as it gets backed up because I am slower than all of them. So once again, the idea is that the rate of producing something on an assembly line is equal to the speed of the slowest person on that line. The same thing occurs with a chemical reaction where you've got multiple reaction steps. Whichever step is the slowest step, the overall speed of the entire process is equal to the speed of that step, i.e. the rate determining step. So here's the bottom line. The amount of time that a multi-step reaction takes is determined completely by its slowest step or rate determining step. It doesn't matter how much time the other steps take, as long as they're faster than the slow step and are therefore not rate determining, the reaction's overall speed will be completely determined and equal to that of the rate determining step. That takes us to a beautiful lecture question. It has been determined experimentally that the following reaction has the following rate law, which means that it's second order in NO2 and zero order in CO. So with that knowledge in our brains, here are the questions. Which step is rate determining? And why does CO not contribute to the rate law? Now, I'm not going to answer these questions for you, but we'll instead let you think about, ponder them, and answer them on your own. That takes us to a wonderful sample exercise. Assume the following reaction proceeds by a single elementary reaction mechanism, as shown here. If that is the case, I want you to predict its rate law. I'll post a link here to an earlier review on how to do that. You're welcome to watch it and then pause and attempt to do this on your own if you so choose. If you wish, you can then click this link right here to watch a separate video in which I do this on the whiteboard. Now, interestingly enough, this reaction in real life actually has a different rate law and it's been determined experimentally to be this. Wow, you can have a rate law that's one half order with respect to one of the reactants? Yeah, you can. But what does this mean? Well, this means that the actual reaction mechanism for this does not occur by a single elementary step, as the question we just did presupposed. It must therefore involve two or more elementary steps. Okay, with that said, I know we've covered a lot in this video. It's been a long video. I want to end summarizing everything that we've learned. First, most chemical reactions do not occur in a single step. Instead, reactants often traverse two or more steps in their journey toward becoming products. Such reactions are called multi-step reactions. The journey through which they proceed is called that reaction's mechanism. Second, most mechanisms involve two or more elementary steps. The overall reaction can be obtained by adding up all of those steps and then canceling out or algebraically simplifying the terms on both sides of the resulting overall equation. Compounds that are found in the individual mechanism steps but don't appear in the overall final reaction are called intermediates. This entire journey can be depicted using an energy diagram like this one. Third, unimolecular reactions are ones that have only one molecule in their rate law. Bimolecular reactions have two and termolecular reactions have three. Termolecular reactions are rare. Next. The slowest step in a multi-step process is called its rate determining step. The amount of time that a multi-step process takes to finish is determined completely by the rate determining step, irrespective of the speed of the faster steps. Yeehaw! That takes us to the end of this lecture. Please stay tuned to the next one in which I'll teach you more about chemical kinetics. Until then, have an enjoyable and wonderful rest of your day.